and some of them are actually pretty obnoxious about it. And it's really interesting um, when they talk about all parties being the same. Apparently, it doesn't include their candidate, and suddenly, not the the pointlessness of voting doesn't, you know, carry the same weight to them because they now have a candidate they want to vote for. So it's kind of interesting um, how people perceive these things and how it changes depending on, um, you know, uh, their their particular interest or their particular uh, sense of representation. I don't know. Anyway, I just thought it was interesting. So speaking of politics, <laughs> I don't mean, I don't, you know, it's it's way too easy, particularly in a show about immigration, to pick on Donald Trump because he's such a buffoon. But um, I can't help it because he is still remains by far the front runner for the Republican nomination. So what he says increasingly as time goes on becomes more and more important, even if it is, as in the case of this uh, thing I'm about to read you, Absolute nonsense. Uh, so this is from Real Clear Politics. It's entitled Trump on Dreamers. Quote, I want dreamers to come from the United States. They're not dreaming now. What could that mean? Let's find out. At a Monday afternoon press conference, Republican presidential frontrunner Donald Trump is asked about the deferred action President Obama ordered for so-called dreamers, young immigrants who entered the country illegally as children. Trump says he wants, quote, dreamers to come from the United States. Now, I can't do a Trump impression, so I'm not going to try. I'm not even really sure what he sounds like exactly. I want dreamers to come from the United States, Trump said. I want the people in the United States to have children. I want them to have dreams also. We're always talking about dreamers for other people. I want the children that are growing up in the United States to be dreamers also. They're not dreaming right now. <laughs> he went on to say it further. President Obama has done nothing for the African American. You look at African American youth. You look at African Americans that are 30 years old, 40 years old, and 50 in their prime, and take a look at the statistics. It's very sad, Trump also said. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'm not even sure what to say about that. So um, what I think he's saying is he's just playing on the word dreamer the dreamers. And he is, uh, there's, a, there's a lot that's wrapped up into this sort of uh, word nonsense. He's, he's a lot like Sarah Palin in that sense. He, he says stuff, and if you think about it, you like look at the words and you go, all right, you can kind of figure out what he's sort of saying. Not that it makes that much more sense. I'll read his exact words to you. I mean, that was just a quote. So here was the question. There are over 100,000 young people known as dreamers who have deferred action given to them. What should they expect? So here's Trump. This is the exact quote. I want dreamers to come from this country. You mentioned dreamers. You mentioned dreamers? I want dreamers to come from the United States. I want the people in the United States that have children, I want them to have dreams also. We're always talking about dreamers for other people. I want the children that are growing up in the United States to be dreamers also. They're not dreaming right now. And you look at African-American youth, I mean 58% unemployment. You look at African-Americans in their 30s years old and 40 years old, and we have an African-American president, and he has not done anything for the African-Americans in this country, okay? And he got a free pass, and he shouldn't have. Because if that were me or that were somebody else, we would be taking over the calls. Believe me, I would not be, it would not be a good situation. 
President Obama has done nothing for the African Americans. You look at African American youth, you look at African Americans that are 30 years old, 40 years old, and 50 in their prime, and take a look at the statistics. It's very sad. <laughs> so th those are his words here. Um, so what I think he's saying, what, what he seems to be implying anyway, is that dreamers, as, as we have traditionally known them, the, the name that is applied to um, uh, young children who were brought over here as kids and who have no legal status, but who have grown up here and spent their whole life here, are the children of other people, meaning uh, what? Non, either he means non-citizens or non-white, or maybe a little of both. I'm not sure which. Um, so what he's saying is he, he wants U.S. kids, U.S. citizen kids, to have dreams. Um, I, I, <laughs> I, I guess what he means basically is that there's, uh, we're in such terrible straits right now. There's nothing to look forward to. There's nothing to, to you know, be optimistic about. So uh, he wants citizen children to have dreams. But I'm guessing he probably doesn't mean, uh, you know, like... Uh, the citizen children of undocumented immigrants, and maybe he doesn't mean them either. I don't know. He doesn't say. But um, that's all I can think of that he's doing. He's just playing off the term dreamers and, and doesn't really understand much of what that term means because he says, I want children that are growing up in the United States to be dreamers also. That's who the dreamers are, children that grew up in the United States. Um, Yeah. Uh, so, so this is the front runner for the Republican nomination. This is who the majority of people who have been polled or uh, whatever so far have said that this is their preference. Wow. I, I'm not even going to try to dissect his thing about uh, Obama not doing anything for African Americans. It's just too weird. Um, it's just way too weird. Uh, okay. So one more Trump thing, just because this guy's the front runner. So, I mean, at one time it was like sort of gratuitous. Trump was a buffoon. Uh, he would say something weird. You could comment on it and, and do a whole bit on Trump being weird. And it was just kind of like it was a cheap shot. It's like having to, you know, uh, some kind of strange uncle or something or, or friend or co-worker you know that everybody knows is 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 a bit unhinged and then you just poke fun at them and by extension you know you sort of pretend that they they, they are the voice of other people but they're really not they're just a wacky outlier and and you know a lot of internet um, pundits and whatever, have done this for years. I mean, this is a staple of bloggers, is find just the, the sort of nuttiest person who, who's vocal about their opinion uh, and who falls within a certain sort of category, like a conservative or a liberal or whatever, you know, whatever the group is you want to stigmatize, find their nuttiest representative with the biggest mouth and then sort of like say, look, this is what these people are saying. Uh, aren't they ridiculous? And then everybody goes, yeah, they're ridiculous. And you've kind of slapped a brush across this whole group of people and, and tarred them with this one person who was an outlier, clearly an outlier from that group. That was unfair, but a lot of people did it it's because it was easy and it just made for quick, easy opinion making. But Trump is different. Trump started out that way, I think. And uh, I would poke fun at him every now and then for that reason, saying, look how, you know, wacky this guy is. But now he has consistently been the front runner this whole time. So that has gone from 
here's a wacky guy who says he's conservative, and I'm going to like uh, poke fun at conservatives by poking fun at him. To here's a guy that the majority of of so-called conservatives claim as their standard bearer. He's yours. You bought him. I mean, uh, you know, if if you are electing him as your representative or way well, yeah, not electing, I guess, choosing him, consistently choosing him and saying this is the guy we want to be president, then what he says now really is what you're saying, basically. At least Republicans, at least enough of them that uh, he keeps staying ahead in the polls and and um, he's starting to win primary uh stuff. So um, Trump has gone from being a, a cheap shot taken at conservatives or Republicans to now being uh, this is who you say you want to represent you. So I think now it is perfectly fair game to read Trump's stuff and comment on it because a lot of people who must also read it or hear it or whatever are still saying, yep, that's my boy. So here you go. Um, here's Trump's conspiracy theory about pro Pope Francis and immigration. Let's see what he says. Businessman and presidential candidate Donald Trump lashed out at Pope Francis on Thursday evening, calling the pontiff a very political person and accusing him of being co-opted by the Mexican government to support immigrants. In an interview with Fox Business Network, Trump was asked about Pope Francis' visit to Mexico, where he intends to pray with undocumented immigrants and immigration activists and celebrate Mass along the U.S.-Mexico border. Quote, The Pope is a very political person, Trump said. I think he doesn't understand the problems our country has. I don't think he understands the danger of an open border that we have with Mexico. Trump then implied that the Mexican government forced the Holy Father to take a stand on immigration. I think Mexico got him to do it because Mexico wants to keep the border just the way it is, because they're making a fortune and we're losing, Trump said. This is, this is your guy, Republicans. He's the one that you consistently are selecting as your spokesman. In reality, Francis, who is from Argentina, has been an outspoken advocate for immigrant rights throughout his papacy. He has condemned anti-immigrant hatred, surprised 2,000 immigrants living in a shelter with Christmas presents in 2013, and his first visit outside the Vatican as Pope was to Lampedusa, a Mediterranean, Mediterranean island that harbors North African migrants traveling to Europe. He also sent a personal letter to a group of Arizona teens volunteering to help immigrants in the United States and thank them for their work. And while Trump famously opposes allowing Syrian refugees and Muslims in general to enter the United States, last year Pope Francis called on every Catholic parish in Europe to take in a Syrian family seeking asylum. And even said the churches who refuse should be required to pay property taxes because he does not see them as genuinely religious. This isn't the first time Trump has criticized the Pope, whom the real estate mogul also says he likes. When Francis visited the United States last summer, Trump told CNN that if the pontiff ever spoke with him about the dangers of capitalism, he would reply inexplicably by saying, ISIS wants to get you. ISIS wants to invade the Vatican. Trump, who claims to be Presbyterian but is not an active member of any church, Presbyterian or otherwise, has repeatedly faced missteps when it comes to religion throughout his campaign for president. He has flubbed attempts to explain communion, told reporters he does not ask God for, for forgiveness because he doesn't believe he's making mistakes, has been unable to name his favorite Bible verse, and evoked laughter when speaking to a group of evangelicals by mistakenly referring to what is often called 2 Corinthians as 2 Corinthians. Trump later blamed the Corinthians' mistake on Tony Perkins, saying the leader of the religious right wrote the number 2 on his speech. Trump was apparently unaware that the book is also always written 
to Corinthians, but referred to differently. Trump has also had trouble comprehending basic aspects of Christian liturgy. When he mistakenly sat through a Presbyterian service in Iowa that included a sermon about welcoming immigrants and refugees, Trump told reporters he assumed the church chose the Bible verses to coincide with his visit, apparently unaware that scripture passages for Presbyterian worship are decided years in advance. And when he visited another church the next Sunday, Trump almost put money into the communion plate, mistaking it for an offering plate. Despite his, virtual, his spiritual slips, Trump does enjoy robust support from a certain subset of evangelicals, the ones that don't go to church that often. <laughs> well, so as far as Trump is concerned, standard bearer, or at least the uh, leading standard bearer for the Republican Party, the Pope has been co-opted by Mexico. And he doesn't understand the problems we're facing. <laughs> so who else is there out there? Well, we remember um, our good friend Marco Rubio, member of the Gang of Eight Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill. His latest attempt to walk away from that is to say that that bill was never meant to pass. Huh. Let's see about this. This is from The Hill. GOP presidential hopeful Marco Rubio on Monday said a controversial immigration reform bill he helped negotiate in 2013 was never meant to pass the Congress. As a member of the so-called Gang of Eight, the Florida senator negotiated an immigration compromise between Republicans and Democrats, but the bill never made it past conservatives in the House who complained it provided a pathway to citizenship for illegal immigrants. Rubio has taken criticism from fellow GOP presidential candidates for his role in the immigration package. On Monday, he suggested the bill was for show, and he never expected House Republicans to go through with it. Quote, the Senate immigration law was not headed toward becoming law. Ideally, it was headed toward the House, where conservative members of the House were going to make it even better. This represents a sharp departure for Rubio, who previously called it a good piece of legislation that House Republicans should take a look at. So, former immigration supporter... turned politician and, uh, dare I say, a liar, Marco Rubio, with his take on the Comprehensive Immigration Reform Bill, which frankly was way, way too conservative and contained a whole bunch of just nonsense about uh, border security and militarization of the border and stuff like that, but it was at least a start. <sighs> anyway, I suppose I should mention that you're listening to CU Immigration here on WRFU LP Urbana and also UPTV. I didn't mention that earlier. So I should also mention that views expressed are those of the speakers and not UPTV, along with all those other things. Um, but yeah, so we're closing in on the, the final portions of our show. Uh, the, the rest of the stories that I have here are, are kind of all over the place. Um, here's something that's a little more local. But I wanted to bring it up because this has been a hot topic in the news. Uh, ICE deportation tactics force Illinois church to action. Christian Pentecostal Church Associate Pastor Gerson Moreno and his congregation members are fighting back against the tactics of immigration officials. Moreno recently announced the church based in Schaumburg, Illinois, would be holding a Know Your Rights seminar for congregants after one was tricked into meeting with immigration and custom enforcement officials who quickly deported him. 
Numerous congregation members were on hand to see immigration agents take Reynold Garcia away one recent Sunday morning as he prepared to attend services. Just hours before that, immigration enforcement agents went to his house while he was away and took his wife and two children. On the morning Garcia was taken into custody, he received several texts from Noel Correa, his wife's cousin, claiming he'd been in a car accident. An officer eventually called Garcia to relay the same message and instructed him to meet officers near the church to be taken to Palatine Police Station to see his cousin and fill out paperwork as part owner of the vehicle Correa was driving. When officers arrived in unmarked cars, Garcia and onlookers realized something was wrong. The very last moment, you know, is when we realized what was happening, said Garcia's friend Hager Gutierrez. I go, no, 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 this is not police. This is ICE. But it was too late because he was already inside the car. Within 24 hours, Garcia found himself in a Texas detention center with his wife and kids. Moreno said the incident spooked church members because Garcia was taken from a place traditionally considered safe. Since then, Correa said he did not send any of the text messages about the car accident. He claimed the messages were sent by ICE agents who had stopped him on his way to service. While stressing the church does not oppose the government or the application of the law, Moreno said people need to be aware of their rights. He and other church leaders are now taking steps to help members of the congregation learn about those rights. We're also letting members know that if anybody is calling you or asking you to leave the church, that you need to notify somebody, he said. Latin Post previously reported a coalition of immigrant, social justice, and faith groups have joined forces to call on President Barack Obama's administration to seize deportation raids. The groups recently delivered a petition calling for relief to Central American refugees. In a statement released to Latin Post, the White House confirmed receiving a petition that included more than 130,000 signatures and a letter on behalf of over 75 diverse organizations. An expert excerpt, not expert, excerpt of the letter reads as follows. Reports indicate widespread problems with due process for many of those in immigration proceedings. A large number of individuals with deportation orders never received notification to appear in court and never had a chance at a fair hearing. This is largely due to the accelerated and aggressive deportation processes put in place recently by your administration. Others had no legal representation on, fending for themselves in a system that is very complicated. President Obama, we have a moral obligation on to provide aid to people seeing violence, and these people have a right to make their case. Your administration must stand up for the rights and the dignity of people seeking refuge in the U.S. And some of those ons, those O-N, are not supposed to be there. They are typos, and I don't know how they got in there. Anyway, the groups further described the ongoing raids and deportations as inhumane and unacceptable, adding there was no way to undo the trauma inflicted on immigrant families that have suffered the ordeal. In addition, the United States Commission on Civil Rights, an independent and bipartisan federal agency, recently called for the administration to seize the raids. The USCCR published a letter to Obama and Department of Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson requesting they end raids that have largely targeted Central American refugees. Led by Chairman Martin Castro, the USCCR is also requesting legal reviews of cases of immigrants seeking asylum and scheduled for deportation in order to check for violations in the due process. The request also stipulates they should be granted pro bono counsel. Following the release of the Commission's statutory enforcement report, the State of Civil Rights at Immigration Detention Facilities last September, Latin Post interviewed Castro. Quote, we have to understand that these folks are coming here to seek asylum. They're coming to be protected from a situation that in their homeland is untenable. They're not going to want to disappear. They want to have their rights enforced. They want to find their asylum case confirmed. So I'm very pleased that this church is standing up. And I want to point out that we, CU Immigration, 
are having a Know Your Rights workshop this coming Thursday. Uh, let's see if I can find the stuff. We have a, actually a couple of different events coming up. So, so the Know Your Rights workshop, Thursday, February 18th, starting at 6.30 at the Urbana Civic Center. Please come at 6.30 and find out your rights. Um, we will have a presentation in English with French and Spanish translations provided, maybe even con cobal. Don't know about that yet. We're working on it. Uh, also, the last Saturday of the month, February 27th, CU Immigration Forum, Forum will be hosting a dance fundraiser. They have volunteer Latin dance instructors, Sean Menendez and Uli Ayala, teaching salsa, bachata, and cumbia. This will be, let's see, where will that be? At the University YMCA. Uh, what time? I don't know. Let's see. Oh. <clears throat> oh, there's a lunch from 1 to 2 p.m. and then 2 to 3.30 salsa, 3.30 to 5 bachata and cumbia. Tickets are $45, and for students, they're $30. So this is a fundraiser at the University YMCA for the CU Immigration Forum on uh, February 27th. And I'm unclear. It, it looks like it starts at 2, but there's also lunch from 1 to 2. I don't know why you would eat lunch from 1 to 2 and then start salsa dancing unless you really want some cramps. But anyway, <clears throat> who knows how that's going to work. But anyway, that is on February 27th at the University YMCA. Um, a dance event like no other. Learn how to salsa dance, bachata, and cumbia. Good exercise. Uh, and, but also, prior to that, Thursday, February 18th at 6.30 at the Urbana Civic Center, we'll ha we're having a Know Your Rights presentation with uh, translations in French and Spanish and maybe even Concobal. We'll see about that. We've got a, a person who can translate to Kanko Bao, but I don't know if they, this person can be there. So um, some stuff coming up. I guess my time is up here. Uh, that is all for this week, this week, this, um, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> this show, that's all for this show. Oh, wow, well, yeah. Uh, you've been listening to CU Immigration here on WRFULP, Urbana and also UPTV. Uh, my name is Mr. Garza. I am your host for this show, and uh, we come to you every Monday from 7 to 8 or yeah, thereabouts. And um, I hope to see you next time. We will be back with more stuff about immigration and whatever else is going on in the world. Uh, there are a few things we didn't get to, but uh, we'll try again next week. And perhaps we'll get to them then. Anyway, I thank you for joining us. I appreciate your participation. And uh, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.